full-on, to-the-bone passion is the greatest combination of your emotions and your abilities that you can possibly experience. It's like Red Bull pulled all, over all five of your emotions, all five of your senses. It'll change your focus. It'll change your, your bucket list. It'll definitely change your heroes. Going past what you thought was your maximum, what you thought was the total potential you had to achieve a goal, is the most gratifying thing you can do on this planet. Passion has a very, very wide berth. It can be as soft as the flame of a candle, or it can be as powerful and as life-changing as the blue flame of a jet engine. Each of us has that blue flame potential in them. Each of us has the ability to take that blue flame and change this planet instead of just being on it. To start that, you have to believe one thing that's critical and fearlessly believe this, that everything is negotiable. You also need to be ready. My flame went from ember to inferno when I saw potential turning into probability, when I saw hope become a reality. A window of opportunity presented itself, and I jumped through it, no regrets. I will never be the same. I had an economics degree from a liberal arts college, which basically means I was qualified to be a professional at nothing, but I could talk for hours about anything as if I were an expert. I got a job with a major bank and was introduced to some of the most amazing, smart business people on this planet. I learned something from every single one of them. The biggest thing I learned was talking the talk. I could talk to CEOs and CFOs and board members. That became invaluable to me later in this story. It's an interesting dilemma to have a set of skills that reward yourself, but no one else. It makes you stop and look and think about the things that are going on in your life. My passion did not get ignited until my family was blindsided by a genetic disorder. We didn't see it coming. Five generations back, absolutely no clue of this. It came out of nowhere. I stopped. I thought about who I was. I was able to make a change. Imagine waking up one morning to find that your seven-year-old, beautiful, healthy, super athlete, straight-A student, had stroke-like symptoms. After six months and dozens of hospitals and specialists, my brother Rick and his wife Michelle were told, it's not a stroke, it's a disease that very few physicians know how to diagnose, and it's a disease that very few people even know what it is. It was called generalized DYT1 dystonia. Anybody ever heard of dystonia? Not me. I thought it was a breakaway Russian republic. <laughs> the facts are... The facts about dystonia, though, are pretty straightforward. It's a neuromuscular disease that's characterized by involuntary muscle movements. We take for granted on a daily basis the symphony of the neurons and synopses that go on in our brain that control everything that we do. But mutations happen. And when mutations happen, and that's basically what happens with dystonia, the signals get crossed. Muscles compete with each other. So what should contract doesn't. Both contract. It's a life of pain. Imagine for a second, you have a cramp in the middle of the night, a charley horse. Have you ever had one last an hour? How about a day? How about a life? 24-7. That's dystonia. Current treatments don't result in full remission, and right now, there is no cure. It's an interesting problem when you look at how much time and how much effort we put into various issues in this country that are misdirected and need to be realigned. My brother Rick and his wife Michelle were in a position, they were poised to be run over. This could have ruined their lives. As a side note, their second child, Samantha, a few years later, was diagnosed with the same disease. Genetic odds, what they, being what they are, uh, were saying our prayers about their third child, Luke. What they found was that there's little information out there. There were very few doctors doing any research, and even worse, there was no one lasered in on a cure. That doesn't make sense. Dystonia is the most prevalent disease you've never heard of. It is the third most prevalent movement disorder behind tremor. 
behind Parkinson's. It actually affects more people in muscular dystrophy, Huntington's, and Lou Gehrig, Gehrig's disease. It hits over half a million people, one third of which are children. Something didn't make sense. Rick and Michelle did the research and talked to the doctors about various treatments. They overnight went from talking about baseball and basketball and Xbox to talking about spinal taps, Botox treatments, deep brain stimulation, or DBS. Imagine as a parent, you have to trust someone, even the most gifted neurosurgeon on the planet, with sticking his hands in your kid's brain, implanting electrodes, and then putting pacemaker-like batteries in their chest so that those electronic charges might counter the dystonia charges. That's scary. In fact, I don't call it DBS. I call it PSS. Pretty scary sh stuff. <laughs> Other treatments were equally as scary. And the amount of medical information that they had to process was overwhelming. Remember, this caught them off guard. There was no hint, there was nothing that was showing that this was coming. When the doctor started wrapping around all of the different issues that were out there, Rick and Michelle had to focus on a couple things because there was hope that was embedded in this. There was hope out there. It was a single gene defect. This type of dystonia had a little bit of progress in the research in that the gene and the offending protein had already been identified. It was not degenerative, like Alzheimer's or like Parkinson's, and the doctors felt it was curable. The doctors said, with this tracking, with more focus, with more money, we can find a cure for this. The bell went off. It became a simple deal. Finding a cure for DYT1 dystonia is only a function of time and funding. Rick and Michelle were, were again, poised to be overrun by that, but now they were beginning to get a little angry. Given those statistics, given all the details that I just gave to you, why were we not, as a planet, hell-bent on finding a cure for this? Why would we not focus on that and get it done? They started doing some research. But before that, I want you to think about something. Now your child has a disease that is curable. That's like having a child that's a POW. They're locked in a life of pain, but you have the ability to save them. How do you ever enjoy a cold beer? or a cookout, or a good night's sleep when your child's a POW. That's the beginning of the passion part. Then the anger stepped in. Why were we not moving forward on this? What they discovered were two major roadblocks. Number one, managed care. Managed care had crept into our healthcare system back in the late 80s, early 90s, but it manifested itself by driving the hospitals into the lowest cost, rock bottom price producing model you can possibly think of. That had a major debilitating effect on much of our research. Doctors, our doctors are the best in the world. They were now focused on raising clinical fees instead of teaching or looking for cures. That made no sense. What little bit of research that was out there, unimpeded, was siloed and very competitive. They got no credit for taking risk and no credit for the high risk, high reward type of projects that have to go into finding cures. You can't accidentally find a cure. You need to take risks. It makes no sense to me. We have our best artists are now stirring the paint. They're not painting masterpieces. Managed Care came in and took away that box of 120 crayons and gave them back that box of four that you get at a restaurant if you eat a good breakfast. There was no upside to that, and I'll give you a good example of what their motivation is. Can you imagine the Goodyear's CEO telling his engineers, hey, fellas, Make me a million-mile tire. Not going to happen. A cure for most of these diseases is not in the best interest of that economic model. It's that simple. Second thing is, the FDA, it takes over 10 years for a new treatment or a new drug to make it from preclinical discovery to use in humans. 10 years. Are you serious? We can get a whole new set of drones drawn up, manufactured, and in the air in less than a year, and we can't get drugs to our kids in less than 10 years? Come on, FDA, that's ridiculous. The Genome Project was supposed to generate hundreds of thousands of new research ideas and potential cures and momentum, and it hasn't, or it hasn't made it through the system. The reality of it is those ideas are there. Our doctors are still the best and brightest, but the system is bogging it down. The system needs a jump start. It's an interesting uh, 
dilemma, as I said. But Rick and Michelle had two options. They go back home, they whine, they cry about the unfairness of this, or they do something about it. They sat at their kitchen table that night and had the most amazing response to human tragedy. They took a long, hard look at what their lives were, what their priorities were, and they decided to go to war. They turned anger into energy. They turned heartbreak into action, and their passion ignited to that blue flame. And that passion became the gale force that became the power behind the perfect storm of courageous patience, unbelievable family and friends, an unbelievable community, and doctors that not only were the best in the world at their profession, but were caring and focused on the cure. That army, together, went to war. The flame had been lit, dorsal fin up, game on, dystonia. We remembered one thing. Regardless of the size of the beast that we were challenging, all things are negotiable. But we had to break some paradigms. We had to create a different charity if we were going to do this and do this fast. Keep in mind, this is a foot race. The faster we fund it, the faster we find a cure, the faster that Tyler and Sammy become regular, living, happy kids again. So breaking those paradigms, we said we had to do something powerful. 96% of the money that we raise goes directly to charity, goes directly through the charity, excuse me, into research and into our awareness programs in less than 90 days. We're not building up big trusts for tomorrow. We are curing this thing now. We are laser focused on one disease, DYT1 dystonia. We're not trying to cure world hunger right now. One disease, one at a time. Lasering in on one disease will allow us to tip one domino. And that domino will tip the next and the next and the next. We are absolutely confident in it. And there's no gray area here. We fund the high-risk, high-reward, uber-creative research that has been strangled out of our healthcare system by managed care. We do a couple cool things to get there, too. We have a summit each year for creative ideas leading to a dystonia cure. We bring in doctors from all around the world, and for two days we say, please, doctors, park your egos at the door, because for the next two days, in a Manhattan-like project, we are going to find a cure for dystonia. We're going to come up with some really cool stuff and new ideas. And what you think might be trivial might be important to this project over here. And we weave them together. At the same time, we use that as a format to bring in the best and newest research ideas. And through the EVS grants that we've established, we'll give away 50, 75, or $100,000 grants to the most creative researchers that bring us their products. We have vetted over 75 to date. And I'll give you a great example of how well this works. Really smart researcher from Duke University came to us and said, here's my idea for dystonia research. One small channel. It's been turned down by almost a half a dozen other locations. We loved her passion. We loved her focus. We loved the fact that she was just doing dystonia research and it was out of the box. We gave her the $75,000 and two years later, she had over a million dollar NIH grant applied to it. And she has more momentum in that project than most of the projects we looked at in the first year that we were there. Amazing. Michael J. Fox, Parkinson's worst enemy, said it beautifully. To find a cure, you have to fund a cure. Let me tell you how we make that real. Hand-to-hand -hand combat, from everything from races to golf tournaments to bake sales to events for the kids, we raised over a million dollars in cash. Cash. We gave, that was fun, but it was more fun giving it away. We took that million dollars, we gave that in a check to the University of Florida Movement Disorder Center. Building a foundation around the proper things, like a mission statement and a motto got us to where that groundswell raised the million dollars. We wanted to be like the big foundations. We wanted a really cool motto. Uh, we also wanted to tell a story, and so we came up with Dystonia Sucks. <laughs> hey, it's not glamorous or sexy, but boy, does it get the message across. Going back to the other piece, we talked the talk. We went out and we met with the people that we needed to raise the capital. And what we found was fascinating. People are very generous and very willing to give if you give them an endpoint, if you give them a reason to do it. They want to be part of a finished product. They're sick of black 
whole charities. They talk a lot, but never finish anything. We also discovered that people, in general, were ready to de-bling a little bit. They were a little burned out on the pimp my ride, pimp my house, pimp my pimp society thing that we got going out there. And they really wanted to invest in making the planet better. So I took a new title. I am now the ambassador of hope for major grants and gifts. And all those weird skills that I talked about became important because we found that corporations had that same sense. Corporations are having a tough time, but they are willing to fund something that has an end and has a solution if you feel that power. We took that million dollars, and my brother got to take something off of his bucket list. And I encourage each of you to add this to your bucket list after this today. He gave away one of those big checks. <laughs> Everybody sometime in your life should give away a big check. That's like the greatest feeling in the world. But we gave him a million dollars cash, not a trust, cash. And we said, we'll give you another million if you need it. What UF did is they combined that with other projects and went after the number one dystonia researcher in the world. A doctor named, a doctor named Yu Kim Lee saw the commitment, saw the passion, saw that this was the path for finding a cure. And he wanted to be a part of that. He moved his entire team to UF and brought with him millions of dollars worth of NIH grants. Our original investment became worth over $6 million. Since he's been here, Dr. Lee has created a specific mouse model that can model DYT1 dystonia so we can look at specific issues and accelerate the cure that way. And now his mice are boldly going where no mouse has gone before. <laughs> We're doing neat things with that. Keeping in mind, everything we touch, everything as we go along, is negotiable. We don't feel like we have any roadblocks anymore. Tyler's hope is through the first phase. We built the momentum, we have the visibility, we connected the doctors with the best researchers, and that momentum is accelerating at an accelerating pace. We are making true that statement. Finding a cure is just a function of time and money. If you think about it, a lot of what we're doing with dystonia research comes down to one thing, tipping that first domino working together with these other researchers, doing the things that the big dinosaurs, the big monolith con conglomerates are not allowing us to do, for whatever reason. We don't care. The reality of it is very little money has been spent to date, and very little time has gone into what's been achieved in dystonia research. Just imagine what can happen with a little bit more of both. Now think outside the box for a second. What if each of us did that? What if each of us went on a passion quest and said, I want to jumpstart something? There are dozens of diseases out there that need that kind of jumpstart, just like what we're doing at Dystonia, just like what Rick and Michelle did. There are also hundreds of human experiences that can be elevated with the right, with the right pressure, with the right focus. The people around the world are not waiting for their governments or corporations or other people to do what's right and lead them to the right, right path of what they want to achieve, they're taking it themselves. Look at what Felix Baumgartner, the CEO for Red Bull, did recently. Crazy Felix jumped out of a balloon at 24 miles above the Earth, but he broke two world records, the highest ascent in a balloon and the fastest fall back to Earth. Two world records. And now NASA wants their details. NASA wants to talk to them about their designs. That's fascinating. So don't be afraid of the dinosaurs. Don't let the, the big Wall Street and healthcare T-Rexes intimidate you at all. Where are dinosaurs now? Smaller, faster, smarter beings replaced them. With the exception of most of our Congress, dinosaurs are gone. <laughs> you can do... <laughs> so I encourage you, find your, find your passion. Find something you can latch on to. Break a few paradigms. Get out there, get aggressive, and be fearless. Enjoy passion. It's the greatest feeling you can ever have, and put it to good use. And remember, everything is negotiable. Thank you.